Databases. A database seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Ottertune. Google. We're excited today to have Iki, who is a uh, pure finder of Neon and a longtime Postgres hacker and committer. Uh, so he's here to talk about uh, the new Neon serverless Postgres database service that he started with uh, Nikito, who's also a friend of the Carnegie Mellon Database Group and a former co founder of, uh, of MemSQL and Single Store. So, as always, as Hickey is giving the talk, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and say who you are. And feel free to do this at any time. That way he's not talking to himself for an hour on Zoom. And with that, uh, Hickey, the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Andy. So my name is Heike Lindegangas. Uh, as Andy said, I've been a Postgres hacker and committer for, for many, many, many years. And uh, now I'm a co-founder of Neon. So what is Neon? Uh, it's three things. It's first of all, it's a startup that we founded in 2021. Uh, uh, from a technology point of view, it's a new storage system uh, written for Postgres. Uh, it's open source. Uh, it separates compute and storage, and I'm going to go into more details on that. But and and the third thing that Neon is, it's uh, the name of the cloud service that we run. Uh, so there there is a public cloud service. You can go there, click a button, and get the Postgres database at neon.tech. Uh, but today I'm going to talk mostly about the uh, the storage engine and the storage system we wrote and the cloud service and how they work together. Um, so in a nutshell, we, the, the core idea is that we separated storage and compute. Um, kind of the original idea when we founded the company was that we wanted to build something like uh, open source Amazon Aurora. Amazon Aurora was the first database that kind of pioneered uh, separating storage and compute for OLTP systems. Of course, many others are doing that now for, for OLTP, but also for, for all app systems, the Snowflake and so forth. But we kind of took that idea and, and ran with it. Uh, it is a single, single writer system. So there's only one primary node that is generating log and processing updates at any given time. Uh, we don't try to solve the multi-master problem. We don't try to solve conflicts against, across regions or anything like that. It's, it's a single writer system. Uh, you can have multiple readers. You can have multiple readers for for high availability purposes or for scaling out your your read workload. But it's only a single writer. Uh, we have a multi-tenant storage system. So we we have one storage layer that we share across all of the customers, all of the databases. They are stored in the same same storage system, and uh, we kind of combing all the data from different databases uh, in memory, and uh, we have a shared cache for them and so forth. But everyone gets their own compute. So when we run Postgres for you, you get your own VM that you can run it in. And in the future, we would like to give, like, we haven't implemented that yet, but the idea is that you could bring your own uh, image and run your own version of Postgres with whatever extensions and so forth you want. Because it's a VM, uh, you, you could do that. Kind of the unique features we have is the copy and write branching uh, and time travel query, and we make those very cheap. Uh, so I want to begin before we dive into the architecture. We love Postgres, so I've, I've been involved with the project for a long time. So when we started, we like very early on, the kind of the decision was that we would try hard not to modify Postgres where possible. And in fact, we would like to get all of the changes we have made into upstream project. And we would like to get like, the goal is that you could run unmodified community Postgres on top of Neon storage. We're not quite there yet, so we are currently carrying a patch that is about a thousand lines of code, but like that, that's pretty small compared to the overall size of Postgres and overall size of the, the storage system. Can you quickly so, say what that what that patch actually contains? Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. So so there's a there's a few bits and pieces here and there, like the 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 main part is actually hooking into the storage system. So normally when Postgres needs to read a page or write a page, we hooked in, in there. So pretty close to where the actual read or write system call happens. Uh, we hook in there. So when you read, we, instead we send the request or storage. Um, but there are there are a few changes here and there to actually support that. So like Postgres, uh, there's, there's a few other places where Postgres relies on local storage or being able to read these files uh, kind of that bypass those APIs. So you have to patch them. There's a few 
few changes we have to make in the buffer cache to track, uh, I'll, I'll go into more details on that, but, but track the LSN numbers of evicted pages. Uh, there's a few few changes like that. But it's it's all really related to the storage. Like we have, what we have not changed is the planner, the executor. We have not changed anything with the index types. So all of the Postgres index types, uh, you know, just uh, B3, all, all of those just work. Uh, because they all work with these eight kilobyte pages, like Postgres always does, and we hook in at that level. Like we deal with pages, and and the write ahead log. We don't we don't know what's in those pages. We don't pay attention to to the contents. It also means that Postgres handles MVCC. Uh, in Postgres, the MVCC is based on on uh, like transaction IDs that are stored on the tuples on individual rows, and again, we don't care about those. Like we don't we don't pay attention to them. Uh, this also means that you still need to vacuum, well, like, like with always with Postgres, we haven't addressed that problem. Um, so the high-level architecture of Neon is, again, separation of compute and storage. And for, the, for us, the compute means Postgres. Uh, so it's a VM that runs, runs your Postgres instance, and the storage is, uh, is our storage system that we wrote from scratch. Uh, it's written in Rust. Uh, that was a fun learning experience for me personally. I hadn't hadn't done anything with Rust before, uh, but it's it's been a good experience. Uh, but it consists of paid servers, safe keepers, and cloud storage, the storage system. And uh, I will I will go into the more detail on that. But uh, first, the the changes to Postgres. Um, Postgres has support for streaming replication, so that's what you use normally if you want to set up a replica. Uh, you can set up. Uh, Set it up so that it streams the log, the right ahead log from, from the primary to the replica. And we kind of hook into that. And instead of streaming it to a replica, we stream the log to our storage system. And instead of reading a page from local disk, we change that so that you send a network request over the network to our page server for, for fetching a particular page. And uh, and one interesting thing is that for us, like the write operation, where normally Postgres would write a page uh, back to disk, uh, like a dirty page, uh, that's a no app for us. So we just throw the page away at that point. And uh, if it's needed again, uh, it, it will be the while replay will be handled by the storage system, and we'll get the get the page image uh, from the page server after the while replay. That also means that for Neon, we don't need to do checkpoints in the traditional way because the writing is, is a no op, so there is no there is no need to like flush everything to disk uh, in Neon. We still run checkpoints. There's still functions called checkpoint, and and we let Postgres run them because it does a lot of uh, kind of other stuff than the core flushing dirty pages to disk. But we don't need to do that that flushing dirty pages to disk part. Uh, so all in all, in Postgres, there's only the local disk is only used for temporary files for sorting and that kind of stuff. But when when we restart Postgres, we can just wipe wipe away all of that. So what is the point of separating compute and storage? Uh, I mean, this is this is very popular nowadays. As I said Amazon Aurora kind of pioneered that, but there's so many other systems that do it for different reasons. Uh, for us, the big reason was uh, that it allows us, us to be serverless. So it means that we can, what, and what we mean by serverless is that we can very quickly shut down the Postgres instance and we can very quickly start it up again. So when you connect to Neon, we, our current startup time is about four seconds. Uh, and that includes like launching the VM uh, or Kubernetes container and, uh, and setting, setting all the connections up to the, to the storage and, and replying back to the client. Another advantage of, of the separation of compute and storage is that you can share the same storage by multiple read-only nodes. So normally you would you, you could scale Postgres by having multiple read-only nodes, but that would mean that you need to duplicate all of the data. Uh, with Neon, they can share the share the storage layer, so all the read-only replicas can be pointed to the same storage. So you don't need to do that. And and finally, you can scale these parts independently. So you can add uh, more read-only nodes, or you can change the size of your compute nodes independently of the storage. And and cloud storage is very cheap. So our storage system uses the like Amazon S3 or something compatible as the final backing store, and that is very cheap, and and which is good. And maybe you you're getting at this, but like the like the, on the serverless side, when you boot up. How do you do you prefetch anything in the buffer pool? Do you like mm -hmm. what do you do to sort of have a, a semi-warm cache instead of like 
complete cold start every single time? Currently, nothing. Uh, so it is a cold. It is a cold start. Uh, okay. The the storage system has its own own cache, so there will be data in there if if you just recently restarted. Uh, but we 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 don't have anything special at the moment to warm the Postgres cache, and uh, we probably will need to do something like that. Is uh, that is a known problem? Uh, the, there are this, extensions to. Sorry, no, go ahead. The, the server cache, though, that's that's the it's the wall, though, right? It's not it's not materialized pages. It's both. It's it, we we do cache okay. in the storage system. Okay. We do cache the materialized pages too. Okay, awesome. Thank um, you. There are Postgres extensions. Like there's a pre warm extension. I think it's actually included with Postgres itself uh, that you can use, and it does work with with Neon as well. So if you if you, if you want to, you could you could use that extension. But that's like that blindly brings in all the pages, right? Like. You, You'd want sort of like what InnoDB does or MySQL does, where like you you want to bring in the buffer pool, the, the like bring in the pages that were like that were just that were in the buffer pool at the last shutdown. Right, it doesn't do that. Uh, I think there is yeah. a function to 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 remember what was in the buffer pool before and, and bring oh. that in, but uh, we haven't okay. integrated that in anyway. So that would be like up to you uh, to set it up. Okay, awesome, thanks. So I'm gonna walk through the right path. So so when Postgres when you modify a page, it goes to the log. And we stream the log to what we call the safekeepers. So we have we have three three nodes, three safekeeper nodes running at, at all times. And there's a consensus algorithm. It's based on Paxos. And uh, the idea is that 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 keeps the, your recent transactions uh, safe, the, keeps them durable. So when 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 you commit a transaction in Postgres, it goes to the log, and we wait until it has been acknowledged by a majority of these safekeeper nodes before we. We acknowledge it to the, the original client. Uh, safekeepers, they have the local SSD drives, and, and we kind of deep, we, we assume that we won't lose more than one one at a time from, from a durability point of view. Uh, but safekeepers don't do much other than that. It's just to, to make sure that we don't lose the recent transactions. Uh, I'm going to make a little detour into the Postgres right ahead log format because this is pretty critical to, to all of the things we do. So. In Postgres, the right ahead log is a, it's a very classical like AWS style uh, implementation. It's physical, so we don't store the like insert update statements. We store eight kilobyte pages. That's the page size in Postgres. Uh, we store those pages and modifications to the pages as, as while records. Uh, Postgres doesn't have an undo log, so that that makes some things easier for us. We never need to worry about like aborting transactions or anything like that. It, the log only moves forward in Postgres. And uh, I said earlier, like Postgres handles MVCC at the higher level, at the top level. So we don't need to worry about that. And that turns out to be a very nice property for, for what we are doing. Um, so kind of continuing with the right path, uh, the next step after we have made this piece of log durable in the safekeepers, uh, we stream it to what we call the page servers. And that's where we have most of the code that and, and most of the complexity and, and design problems in, in the page server. That's really the key of the of the storage system. So the Postgres, uh, the 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 page server digests, like processes the incoming the right ahead log, and uh, it processes it into 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 a format where we can quickly find all of the while records of a particular page. And then it writes it in this like pre-processed format into immutable files on disk. Uh, I'm going to go into more detail on, on that exact file format. And there's some interesting problems and, and uh, ideas there. I, I hope actually that some of you all will, will have ideas on, on what we could do there to do it better. But I'm going to go through what we have. But the, but, they, but the basic idea is that we write the data into immutable files on disk. And then we also upload them to cloud storage. Uh, we keep a copy in the page server too for, for caching purposes, like for fast access, but everything is also uploaded to the cloud storage. And now if you look at the durability, what this means is that we, the durability is kind of handled by two components here. It's the safekeepers for the recent log and the cloud storage for all of the older data that has already been processed by the page server. But the page server itself is, is not a, it's not a critical component. So if we lose the page servers, that's OK. Uh, we can just spin up a new one, and it will download the stuff it needs from the cloud storage, which will take a while, of course, if you have a lot of data. Uh, but you don't lose data. Uh, so the durability is handled by the safekeepers and the cloud storage. Okay. Now, 
that was the right path, and that 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 is like what happens when when to the modifications. But the the critical functionality of the page server is that it can reconstruct like using this log that it has stored, it can reconstruct any page in in the system at any point in time. So we keep all of the logs, well, up to some retention period. I mean, disk space is cheap, but it's not infinitely cheap. Uh, but this this kind of replaces your traditional base backup uh, and while well archive. So we keep all of that uh, in the page servers and in the cloud storage in a format that we can access, like random access. So the page server can reconstruct any page at, at any LSN at any point in time. Now, so now when Postgres requests a page, when you need to read a page, it sends this request to the page server, get page number 100 or get page number 200 uh, at, this, at this point in time. The page server will, will find the last image of that page, replay the log over that single page and kind of send back the, the replayed version of the page. All right. And so, yeah. and, and the LSN is sufficient to know, like the Postgres says, I need page one, two, three. And you would have an LSN of what that you think should be in that page. And you would know the page server doesn't have that, that log record. It has to go wait for the, the safekeeper to send it or they actually go to request it. That's a great question uh, or statement. Yes, that's exactly how it works. So when the page, when Postgres requests a page at a particular LSN, if the page server doesn't have it yet, uh, it will wait. Um, and that's that's how we kind of make sure that we're we have the like read after write consistency. So when Postgres modifies a page, it goes to the log. Then when you need to read the page back, uh, we we know that we have the the most recent version of the page or the version that you requested. Okay, so and so then that I mean I, I don't know the full, full details of how Postgres does on the inside. Does Postgres maintain you know for page one two three? I expect that this LSN or that's something you guys are adding. That's something we had to add. Like yeah, okay, actually, we, I mean, that wasn't really needed for correctness actually. Like from the correctness point of view, we could always, like if it's the primary node that's running, the primary node could always request the latest LSN that it wrote um, and that would mm -hmm. be correct. But yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that would have a performance problem because now it, pretty much every time you read anything in page server, we would need to wait to get the latest version or the, the, the latest log. And most of the time there were no changes to that, to that version. Yeah, all right, so that, that's one of the patches you've added yeah. Like, got, yeah, okay, we had I, to. Yeah, we had to yeah, add yeah. this 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 little cache that that tracks the LSN yeah. numbers of of pages that have been evicted from the cache. So we track, uh, I think we track like the last thousand pages that have been evicted, like an, in an LR, LRU fashion, and yeah. and what was the LSN of each of these pages. So if you request back one of those pages that was recently uh, evicted, we we will you we will know that the, what was the last LSN that had changes on it. Got our, for those of you listening home, that's the secret sauce right there. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Thanks. Yes. Uh, putting it all together, there's finally there's the control plane and proxy. So I mentioned that the, the storage is multi tenant and the Postgres is, is like single node uh, computing uh, or VMs. So we needed something that manages all of this. So, so actually, when the user connects or like the client connects, it first connects, first connects to a proxy. And uh, the proxy intercepts the connection, performs authentication. That's all like, uses the same Postgres protocol, uh, so it's transparent to the users. But then it will ch it will ask the control plane like, where is this Postgres instance running? Where is this database running? And if it's not running, we actually shut down these instances after five minutes of in inactivity. Uh, it will launch it, and uh, and then it will connect you to the to the instance. Uh, is, the is, that, is that proxy written? Sorry, I'm, I'm asking a lot of questions. Is that, go, proxy go ahead. Written, is that written from scratch or did you, did you take like PG Balancer or PG Cat or like a PG Cat didn't exist? Did you start uh, with we, PG Balancer? Yeah, we, we wrote it from, from scratch. So we don't we don't use the proxy for connection pooling. We only Got use it, it as a as a like a pass through to proxy just for the just for this purpose of uh making sure that the instance is running. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, so the control plane also provides the web user interface and user facing APIs. So like when you actually go to the website and click buttons and, and create databases, that's what handles like and Connex puts all of these pieces together. Like it tells the Postgres instance where is which page server you do you need to connect to or where, where is the data and all of that. All right. So 
that was kind of the overall architecture, but now I want to dig a little bit deeper into the storage engine and how do we actually, as Andy said, the secret sauce of how do you, how, do, how can we reconstruct any version of any page and how do we store that and, and how, how do we make that perform? So just a kind of a preface here is like, if you think about the traditional point in time recovery system, like normally with Postgres or other, many other databases work the same. Like the typical scheme is that you take a backup, like say every night or every week or something. And then you also archive all of your logs. So you 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 stream your log files to 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 cloud storage or, or some durable storage. And and that way you can you can recover to any point in time. So in the classic example is that if you accidentally drop a table, um now you need to do point in time recovery to the point just before you accidentally drop your table. So what you do, you take the last backup before that point in time, uh, restore it on a different server probably, and then you replay all of the log up to that point. And uh, that, I mean, that works. That's how that's how you you normally do, uh, but it's it's a bit tricky and people people don't do that very often because it's a pretty painful operation. Uh, like one problem is that if you accidentally go one second too far, now you have to start from scratch again, and that's kind of painful. So, but but with that in mind, what we kind of what we do in Neon is kind of the same idea. We have, but we do it at the page level granularity. So we keep images, like backups of pages, individual pages, and then we store the while records of these for these individual pages. Now, so now when you request a page at a particular point in time we find the last image of that page and we find all of the while records on top of that for that single page and we replay it. Um, but in order to make this actually perform, like the, the right ahead log is, is it's, in, it's in wrong format. It's, it's, it's written sequentially. So you can't easily find all of the while records for a single, for a single page. So this is, this is the magic that the page server does. It reorders the log uh, and builds a little index on, on it so that we can quickly find the, the records for a particular page. The other thing that we need to do, uh, like no, the, the, the Postgres log contains a mix of page images and, and the wall records. Postgres has its own reasons. Sometimes, sometimes it, it prefers to write a full image of a page. If, for example, if you're loading bulk loading data, it will typically create full images of those pages. Or if you're building an index or, or many other reasons, it just, copies a uh, full copy of the page to the log. Uh, but most most of the time you just record, you just include these while records that kind of store the delta between the old and the new version of the page. Um, but you could have, in the Postgres log, you could have a million records on top of the last full image of the page. And that would mean that when someone requests that page, we would need to replay a million records kind of on the fly and that that gets slow. So what we need to do is to also prematerialize and store some additional images of these pages. And uh, that's much of the heuristics in, in the page server is when to do that and, and when exactly do you do we want need to do that? When do we want to do that? Um, do you only store for, for a given for one given page, do you only store like the latest version or do you like in the page server or do you could you materialize we, multiple ones? We can materialize them all. So that's the that's the key thing that I think I think makes this special. So we can we can reconstruct any page version up to the retention period. And like the, the idea is that this will re replace your traditional backups and and the wall archive. So instead of keeping instead of ha having backups every day and keeping them for a month, you would just set the retention period for a month and let the page server keep all of that history and be able to re still reconstruct any version of those pages. That's the, yeah. that's the idea. And do you do like on the page server, like on the physical storage, are you doing any compression or de deduplication of this of the pages? Uh, currently, no. That's okay. that's something we definitely need to do or, or like should do. That's kind of an obvious uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> optimization yeah. to do. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Uh, I think there was someone raised their hand. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah, go for it, Matt. Okay. Um, does this mean, so like, if you don't set fill factor right, that's more, more just like a uh, interaction with auto vacuum, right? Like where updates could span multiple pages and you just need the auto vacuum to come along and clean that up. But with this system, where you're keeping page versions, 
Does that mean you just get a bunch of write amplification if you don't have your fill factor knob set right? If you have a bunch of updates, I guess. Yeah, that's true. We haven't done anything magic about or anything special about vacuum. So vacuum will create new versions of these pages. Uh, that's kind of okay. I mean, those while records are pretty small. Uh, it, it's, they just contain the, the list of tuples that were removed from the pages. Uh, but that, 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 that's, yeah, we haven't done anything special about that. So vacuum will create new versions of these pages. Cool, thanks. Um, so, so whenever Postgres needs to read the page, it sends this request. Uh, and this is something that Andy already kind of asked, but what LSN do number do you use in this request? Uh, we, we track this last evicted LSN uh, in the primary. Uh, but the other case is that if you have a read only node, like if you, if you want to do this time travel query, for example, if you want to recover to the point just before you drop the table, uh, you just launch a new Postgres node and you point it at the page server and, and you give it the LSN that you want to read the data as of. And uh, in that case, the Postgres will send all of the requests at that specific LSN. And now you kind of see the data as it was at that point in time. Kind of the third option is that you can have a read-only uh, replica or read-only node that follows the primary. And it will, it, in that case, it, there is a, there's a cache validation, invalidation problem. And if you have a read-only replica that's following the primary, it will actually need to pro, pro, still process the original write ahead log from the primary to, to figure out which pages are being modified because it might have a version of those pages in cache and it needs to throw them away. Um, but the way it looks like from the page server side is that it will kind of it will request the pages with an increasing LSN as it as it tracks the primary. So let's move, move to the storage engine and how does that work? Like what is the internal on disk file format that we use and so forth? So first of all, we model this as a key value store. So we store pages and and uh, and, and these LSN numbers. So but but the way we store it internally or model it internally is a key value store. Um, so in this case, the key is the, the block number and the relation ID, like which table or index does this block belong to, and the LSN. So it's kind of a two-dimensional key value store, and this is a bit special. I haven't I didn't find like good existing implementation that would like have this concept of, of uh, like a two-dimensional key in that sense. And the value is the eight kilobyte page or the wall record to, to reconstruct that from the previous page version. We also store some, some, some other metadata keys like the, to track, for example, relation size. So when, when a table is extended, we, we keep another key value pair that just tracks the size of the, of the table. And, and there's a few other things like that. Sorry, I, I, I misunderstood. What's special about the, the multi-attribute key? Like what, uh, why? Well, the LSN dimension is, is kind of special. So we, first of all, we, we're doing range kind of range queries on that frequently. So when you request a page at the particular LSN, what we actually need to find is the previous, is the, the last version of that page before that LSN. It's not like a point lookup. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there are there are systems that can do range queries, of course. But the other the other point is that it's like the LSN num number keys keeps in incrementing as we digest new well, and we don't replace the old values with that. We just kind of add to it uh, and we keep keep the history too. Okay. So we, we took inspiration from log structured merge trees that, I mean, they have a lot of, lot of the characteristics that we need. Uh, like one is that we want, to, we want to use the cloud storage and log structures merge trees has this nice property that it's based on immutable files. Like you never update a file in place. Uh, you just always accumulate data into new files and you sometimes you do these background operations to rewrite them, but you never try to update them in place. And uh, that, was really, that was really important in order to be able to use the cloud storage because the cloud storage really works by uploading or downloading files. It, it doesn't make it easy to, to do point update or like update individual records or pages. Um, so we looked at log structures merge trees, and it's kind of a similar idea. We buffer the incoming log uh, first in memory, and we like index it in memory in a little B tree, uh, just to 
just to hold it you know, there. And when roughly one gigabyte of log have accumulated in memory, it's written out to what we call a new layer file. And this would be like in log structured merge tree terms, this would be on an SS table. Um, and yeah, we never modify them in place. We just, then we start collecting or accumulating the next batch and we write that out. So kind of the obvious question is, why didn't we just use RocksDB or, or you know, some other existing LSM tree implementation? Because there is a lot of similarity here. And, and we thought about it. I, I actually looked around and Googled around a lot, trying to find something that would fit the bill. But I didn't quite find anything that, that works and kind of ticks all of the boxes we, we have. Um, if I missed something, if anyone out there in the internet has ideas on like what, what might work here, I'm, I'm all ears. I, I'd love to hear your feedback. But like the, the, big, the big stumbling point or the kind of thing that didn't work very well for us was this accessing history part. Um, in a very early prototype that we had, we actually used RocksDB and we, we just used the, the block number and the LSN as the key, like that combination was the key. But it, it didn't behave very well. So, so when, we keep, when you keep accumulating new versions of a page, you, what that means in that scheme is that you insert new key value pairs. Um, but then when, when you do compaction, you kind of move those existing keys to the next level and the next level and next level and so forth. But that's not what we want to do because we know we're not going to modify those keys. And, and, we, and there's no, never any tombstones and we never remove stuff as such. Uh, so that didn't really work for us. There was a, the, the right amplification was pretty bad with that. Um, got them for the other thought is that many of these LSM tree implementations, they actually natively have support for snapshots and they have the capability to, to like read older versions of, of key value pairs. Uh, and they, they typically do that for like MVCC and snapshot isolation. So you can take a snapshot and read many keys as of that, that snapshot. Uh, many, many key value stores we looked at have that capability, but they don't really expose it the way they the way we wanted like many of them wouldn't allow us to use our own LSN number as that key uh, as the, for that dimension or they would only allow you to take a snapshot and then read all of the data but it wouldn't allow you to take a snapshot in history like after the fact uh, they would only keep the snapshot while the system is running so I, I couldn't find anything that kind of fit, fits that bill the other other thing with the history is that we store these images and we store the deltas and there are two very different kinds of records so so when you're doing a search you need to find all of the deltas or that means all of the while records for that page uh, until you hit the last image so it's not enough to find the latest uh, key value pair for that page you actually need to find multiple key value pairs uh, so that you can collect all of the while records uh, until you find the last image of that page and the third point of this is that we wanted to control this materialization. So we want to have, we want to be able to create the new materialized versions of pages when when we reshuffle the data, like in in background operations. Uh, so some implementations we looked at, they would allow us, to, they they might allow you to hook into the compact or, or merge operations and and rewrite some of the keys at that point, uh, but not all of them. And like like we we really wanted to have control of that process. Finally, does this upload and download to cloud storage? But again, some, some key value stores do that natively, but not all of them that we looked at. Uh, branching this is another feature. Like we want to have these cheap copy and write branches. Uh, that might be actually okay. Like we, the way we've implemented this in, in, in this our, our own storage engine anyway is kind of at the higher level. So we create a new storage for each branch. And then if you fall the bottom of that, fall, fall through the bottom of that storage without finding the, the version of the page, then you look at the parent. So that might have actually worked with, with the existing ones. Uh, finally, the we wanted to have find something that's written in Rust or other memory safe language. So so our storage system is multi-tenant. So we 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 share the buffer cache in the storage. Uh, across different databases, possibly belonging to different customers. And uh, we really don't want to have a seg fault that causes an outage for everyone because of one database having problems. Or worse, we, we definitely don't want to accidentally leak data 
uh, from one one database to another. That would be that would be way way worse. So we really wanted to have, especially if we're going to modify it. Like if we would take something as the starting point and modify it to do all of the things we wanted to do, like I wouldn't trust myself to to write that code in in C or C plus plus. It would have to be uh, some memory safe language. Uh, finally, we already have a write ahead. I mean, we're restoring the write ahead log format, write ahead log in this format. Oops, that's the screensaver. So we are storing the write ahead log, and many of these other key value stores they they come with the write ahead log, and like we don't need that. We already have one. Although many many do allow you to turn that off though. So, what did we do? Um, our storage consists of these immutable files. Again, in LSM tree terms, those would be SS tables, but we call them layer files. And there are two kinds of layer files. Uh, there's delta layers and image layers. And uh, the image layer contains like a snapshot of all of the key value pairs at one particular LSM. So it's, it, that's like the baseline uh, snapshot or backup of a particular range of keys. And then there are delta layers, which which consist of uh, all of the changes, all, like all of the key value pairs uh, in a particular key and LSN range, um, but only if it was stored. So we don't we don't copy or make copies of pages that have not been modified in those. Um, this is better explained with this with this picture here. So we think of the storage format as a two dimensional storage. So at the top, you can you can see these delta layers. Um, they con like it's a rectangle, so it contains all of the wall records in for a particular key range and a range of LSNs, like a range of time. And then in addition to that, there's these image layers, which is a snapshot at a particular LSN. So it's it doesn't cover any range of LSNs. It's at the particular LSN, but it contains all of the key value pairs at that point in time. And we, we try to maintain so that every file is roughly the same size. We were aiming at roughly one gigabyte uh, file size. That seems to be pretty good for dealing with uh, cloud storage. Um, yeah. So when you need to search, like this is the basic read operation. When, when we get a get page request, um, you start from the requested point in time, like the requested LSN and the requested key. And we scan, like we, if you think about this as a two-dimensional problem, we search downwards uh, and we look into the layer file here and uh, we, we collect all of the wall records for that particular key uh, in that file, if there are any. Then we continue the search on this file if there are any records for it there. Uh, so forth until we hit the, the image layer. And the image layer contains images of all of the pages in, the, in that key range. So we can stop the search there. And now we've kind of accumulated all of the, the, the last image of that page uh, from the image layer and all of the wall records on top of that. And now we can replay them. There might be images of this, of this page in, in these delta layers or uh, as well, and then we can stop the search earlier. But like in the in the worst case, we have to scan until we hit the last image layer. So that kind of puts the backstop on on how far back uh, we need to scan. Um, now, when new new incoming wall is processed, we create a new file at the top. That's the new delta file. So that's that's like a that's basically the original write ahead log, just reordered uh, and stored in our format. That makes it faster to look up. And then we have these background operations to create new image layers that runs every 20 seconds or something, I think. And uh, the point of creating these image layers is that it speeds up the searches. So I mentioned that if you're searching, it, it kind of acts as the backstop. So if there are no images of that page earlier, uh, by the time you hit the image layer, it's definitely going to be there and you can stop the search. It also allows us to do garbage collection later. So if there are any versions or, or any pages down here uh, that have been modified later, uh, that allows us to later garbage collect these files because we know that there's going to be an image here. Uh, and then we have a compaction operation. And this one I'm not 
100% sure if this actually makes sense for us. And this is something that I'm, I'm still kind of thinking what would be the right strategy or when to do this. But the basic idea of compaction is that we take these uh, delta layers and we reshuffle them into different shaped rectangles that contain all of the changes for a larger key range, but a smaller, a uh, larger LSN range, but a smaller key range. And like the, this is equivalent to the merge operation in LSM trees, where you go, you merge into the next level uh, in your uh, LSM tree. The reason I'm not 100% sure this makes sense for us is that we usually can't actually get rid of any data here because we are still keeping the history. So we're just kind of rewriting the data in, into a different order. It can help with the searches because now you have fewer, like when you're doing a search from up here, we don't need to visit so many layers, so, so many files, um, but maybe we could get the same benefit with some uh, something like a bloom filter, which is typically used with LSM trees, uh, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, but one thing it will do, it will aid with the garbage collection later. So if, if, if you have a skewed, uh, workload where you have one part of the database that you never update. You just load it with a lot of data and you, you never update it again. And then you have another part of the database that you, you keep updating more frequently. Uh, like this, this reshuffling operation allows us to, to uh, keep, keep uh, to basically garbage collect the, the, the part that updates more frequently uh, more often. Finally, I mentioned we have garbage collection. So conceptually, the idea of garbage collection is that there is a like there's a line. There's a, there's like one week or a month or something a period. Like how far back do we need to be able to reconstruct these pages? And uh, if we have the images and the data of all of the later versions, we can we can remove these old files that we don't need anymore. That was the tour of that. Uh, I included a picture here. This is actually a colleague of mine wrote a little tool to to extract uh, diagrams like this from from the actual files that we created. So this was a this was a dump from from some test workload, and it, you can see here that there are these files at the top. These are the delta files, and then you have different shape files and image files. I'm not going to go into the details and try to like explain this any further, but this just serves. Uh, it's a nice visualization of, of how it actually looks like from a, from a real cluster. Um, so that's that's basically how the storage format works. The one thing that I didn't mention yet is the branching. So we support cheap copy and copy and write branches, and that's also what we rely on for backups. Like this 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 replaces your traditional backup and, and restore operations because we keep the history. Um, and the way that works is that when you create a branch, we just start a new storage um, at that LSN, uh, like from, from scratch, so like a new empty storage. And then whenever you search, you, if you don't find the page you're looking for uh, in that, you continue the search from the parent uh, at the point where the, the, the branch was created. So that, that's pretty, that, that kind of fell fell off from the storage format pretty easily and kind of as a bonus when we started to design this thing. And that actually turned out to be a very nice feature and, and kind of a unique feature. Um, so there are some open questions with this. Um, we haven't really addressed this. So these are like open questions for me. Like how often does it make sense to materialize these pages like preemptively? Uh, we don't really need to materialize or do the water replay until the compute requests a page. Uh, and if you have a small database, it's quite possible that you like load it with data, you do a lot of updates, and then you delete all of the data. data and we wouldn't necessarily need to ever like replay the log in the page server. We, we just need to store it. If the page server never requests a page, we don't need to replay it. On the other hand, if the page server does request these pages, like if you have a workload that doesn't fit in, in, in the cache in Postgres, then it will frequently keep requesting the pages that it wrote a while ago. And now, now you would really want to have low latency. And it's kind of bad if we do need to do the replay at that point, because it does show up. Like it, it does take a few milliseconds to collect the records and do the replay. Um, 
so when exactly do we want to kind of do that preemptively before before we get a request? I, I we haven't really solved that problem. Like when when would be the optimal? What would be the optimal strategy for that? I don't know. What about do you um, like again because you're serverless? Yep. When a after what five minutes you decommission the compute layer, do you send any signals down to the to the I guess the page server to say? Mm. Hey, Hey, by the way, this guy disappeared. So either <laughs> clean things up right now or maybe give it a lower priority and clean it up at some later point. Uh, we don't currently. That might okay. make sense. On the other hand, uh, it's quite possible. I mean, still, even if it's inactive for five minutes, it's still probably more, it's still probably more probable that it becomes active soon and mm -hmm. and then then you'll little need it than, than it is for some any other random uh, database to become active so i i'm not sure that that might be something we want to we should collect stats on and see what it actually looks like uh yash has a question hi uh, yeah i have a question um how do compute servers know which page server to read from for a specific page so the the control plane keeps track of that like which page servers contain the data for which database so when when it launches the the postgres instance it, it you know it passes that as a parameter like the the, the host name and uh, port to connect. So like, would it be like uh, a range of page numbers go to one server or is it more like ah, there's more things? No, so we haven't, we don't currently do sharding at all. So it's cur currently the way this works is that there is only one page server for one database, but that's that's something we will we will be working on in the future, like sharding uh, and spreading the workload across different page servers. Like this architecture would allow us to do that pretty easily. It's, it's very easily shardable, uh, but we haven't done that yet. That makes sense. And then another quick question. Um, for reading from paid servers, do you guys find yourself more limited by network bandwidth or disk bandwidth or like something else? Yeah. Uh, we're kind of having problems with all of the pieces at the moment. Uh, so there are there are like one thing we we ran into very, very soon and we're only now starting to address actually is the uh, like sequential scan speed. Postgres normally relies heavily on the operating system cache for sequential scans. So when you're scanning, it will just request page number zero, then page number one, then page number two, and so forth. And in that workload, what come, came up very quickly is that if you, if you do a round trip to the page server for every individual page, uh, that's very slow. So in that case, it was the network round trips. That was the problem. Uh, we added prefetching support, so we now we're, we're not smarter about that, and we will like send send batches of requests to and kind of eliminate that problem. In other workloads, what shows up is this overhead of reconstructing the pages, doing the water replay uh, if there were a lot of changes on the page. Uh, in yet other workloads, we have some some test cases where we have a lot of layer files. If you have a lot of history, uh, we had a, a like a dumb algorithm for for keeping track of these these what layer files exist and and that then that came up as, as consuming a lot of cpu but you're addressing that with a different data structure there so it's kind of depends on the workload i mean some some workloads have hit issues with the network uh, others we just have a lot of overhead that that and like low hanging fruit that we will need to fix in the page server thank you thank you Mer I, 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 I don't Go to go to tinge here. Can you merge uh, wall records like if they're contiguous? Like if you know, like LSN one two three and LSN one one two four, uh, they both update the same record or even the same page, and then you say, all right, rather than me applying them, in, you know, incrementally one after another, I can combine them to a single log record. Uh, then it's batch applied. Uh, but I guess if someone wants one two four, then you you have to you have no way to go back. Yeah, uh, first, we haven't done that, but what, yeah. but we've definitely thought about that. Uh, so what we could do is to merge records uh, between commits. So no one yeah. cares about the, like the, what happened between two commits. That's invisible to the users. So definitely between commits, we, we could do that. Okay. Second thing is that I'm, I'm not sure how much that would really save. Like if you insert one tuple and then you insert another tuple the same page, like if you merge those into a single bigger of a record, it would still take roughly the same amount of space and probably roughly the same amount of CPU work to, to apply. So I'm not sure if, if that makes sense, unless you can actually like eliminate some steps. Like what might make sense is to record the after image of, you know, what 
Mm. Uh, what was the, the version of, what did the image of that page look like after you replayed all of these records? And, and then, it might, then it might help. Uh, awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah, I am actually pretty much at the end of the presentation, but like some of these open questions is, is like, when do you materialize these pages? When do you create these image layers? And there's something I already mentioned is like, when do you, does it make sense? And when should we merge these Delta layers together and to kind of be able to, to scale this? Uh, so yeah, that, 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 those were the qu open questions I have, but uh, I'd, I'd love to hear more questions that you all might have. Okay, awesome. I will clap on behalf of everyone here. Uh, so we have uh, nine minutes for questions. I've already asked a ton, uh, but I'll, I'll give everyone, uh, everyone else a chance to go for it. So if you have any questions for Hiki, go for it. Just unmute yourself and fire away. You're all fools. All right, fine. I'll take the time. Thank you. Um, so again, going back to the service thing, at any given t moment of time, and I, and I realize this, this will vary during during the day, but like, what percentage of the databases that are in Neon are like swapped out? Like, how much are you guys saving? You know, your customers like, you know, ninety five percent of the databases can be swapped out at, at any given point in time, or is it is it a lower number? Right at the moment, we try to keep everything in the page server, so we would all, we actually only rely only rely on this swapping out uh, if we have to kill the page server and and reload it. So currently, we 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 still don't have that much data that we would need to swap things out. Uh, like we we've, we've we've had this service running for a few months now, and and that has not been enough time to create enough pro <laughs> enough data to actually yeah. have to swap anything else. But I'm thinking of just doing like a least recently used uh, scenario, and then I mean, then it's up to us. Like, how much, how much local disk space do we wanna do we wanna have in the page servers, and and we, like we would keep as much as we can fit. Got it. But but I mean, also, so and there's that, and then there's also the compute layer. What so what percentage of of the like the Postgres instances in Neon are like decommissioned on the, at the compute layer at any given uh, time? I do have numbers on that. We have roughly between 50 and 100 active computes at any given time. And, and okay. remember, we shut them down after five minutes. So these are the numbers that are actually active. And yeah. I think we have about 3,000 uh, registered users who have created databases. Got it. Uh, okay. So yeah, you can, you can do the math from there. OK, cool. Um, but it, it varies. Like there is, there is a like it's like a power distribution. Like some some databases are active. Like some people have already put something in production, even though we're you know if you're still in beta. But some people are brave and they put production databases on them and they have applications running pretty much all the time. And then there's others who who well a lot of people just sign in and and kick the tires and go never come back. Uh, but there is but but then there's people in between like who who run daily jobs. I think we just had a uh, just looked at the customer case where they were running a batch job twice a day. So they would load a bunch of data and uh, then do some processing on that. And, and then it would, go, it would go idle and they would do that twice a day. Got it. Okay. Um, and, then, uh, and then everything's just running Kubernetes. From, so you just, so when someone connects, you just spin up a, you know, you just, you just fire up the pod to say, Here, you know, here's now the compute layer. And then it talks to the page server, gets whatever it needs at, you know, on demand. Correct. Um, you, you mentioned it takes four seconds for, uh, if you have a decommissioned instance, they connect to it and, you know, you, you figure out who they are and then, you know, where they have access, of course. Uh, and then you bring up that, that pod. Do you know how that competes or how that compares against like, you know, uh, Postgres is serverless for, from Amazon? Uh, I don't think Amazon shuts down completely. So okay. it, it only allows you to scale up and, and dump. I don't think they scale down to zero. Okay. Uh, and I don't know how long it takes for, if you, like, I think there's a manual operation, for, but, but I, I don't know how long it takes for them. Okay. I was just uh, like for, yeah, from what I know from our numbers, it's like the, like the, where, where is, so where's that time spent? So it's it's about one second between one and two seconds for for spinning up the pod, uh, and before we like before any of our code runs. I, I think it's about one second or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, it takes a few hundred milliseconds to download what we call a base backup, which is a Postgres data directory, but it doesn't have any of the data because that's downloaded separately. But we still need the Postgres data directory. 
um, so that Postgres can start up and, and it can find all of the, you know, everything that's not a table or, yep. or index uh, in there. So that takes takes few hundred milliseconds to to download, extract, and 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 get Postgres running. Uh, after that, we run a few queries. I think we do like run some uh, run a couple of queries to 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 check that it works. Um, takes a few hundred milliseconds. Then in our control plane, there is like we try, when when we start this operation, we add a record to an internal database to 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 remember that we started this pod. And and there's like a few hundred milliseconds goes into our internal bookkeeping in the control plane, currently, basically. Um, and and yeah, and, and then there's the like the round trip latency uh, just going to the client too. So all in all, uh, like that adds up to roughly four seconds. We could and and we definitely actually want to get that down to to like one second or something like that. Like four seconds is is it's okay for many applications, but it's not quite fast enough that you wouldn't care. Like many uh, with with four seconds, many applications would try to to artificially keep the uh, keep the database. Um, active, which we which we want, don't want people to do. We would do want them to shut down if they're inactive. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So, uh, Kriti has a message, a question on the chat. Do you have any benchmarks against Postgres hosted on cloud? So, I guess it'd be RDS or Cloud SQL or something like that. Uh, we run some PG Bench tests uh, internally. It depends on like what, what are your company. Yeah, it can be competitive. Like we can we can get pretty close to 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 that. But of course, it depends on how much resources we we throw at it. Like we we can we can get pretty close to the performance of RDS, but that's like I don't know how much we're, we're probably spending more CPU time and, and resources to to achieve the same level of performance currently. Maybe a better, uh, better better question is like: Is there a workload where you would actually end up doing much worse on Neon, where the the application would be better off running like you know stock Postgres and RDS or something? I, I don't think it's like. I'm sure we still have like silly mistakes and stuff like that, but sure. discounting that, like looking at the architecture, I don't think there's anything that would be particularly harmful. Uh, I mean, you can't beat a local SSD for, I mean, that's just, sure. yeah, 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 that, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not gonna happen. But like, if we do all the caching and all, all, all of that, uh, like in, in a good way, I, I don't think there is a particularly hostile workload. I was just sort of thinking there's, we come across customers, this is for Autotune, where they were running Postgres RDS, they switched to Aurora because they somehow magically thought it was gonna be faster. Mm -hmm. And then like it turned out to be worse, plus they're paying you know 20% overhead over, over that anyway. Um all right, uh my last question would be um since you're sort of cutting off the storage layer of Postgres, um, and Postgres famously relies on the OS page cache for mm -hmm. you know for caching pages, is there any I mean, I'm guessing the answer is no, but is there anything you had to change to deal with maybe an assumption that Postgres makes about having an OS page cache? Or has there been any surprise that like, this turned to be way easier than, than you thought it would be? I'm assuming there's no issue I can think of, but. Uh, yeah, curious. the sequence of scans was one thing. Like we depend on, Postgres depends on operating system to do the read ahead for you. Uh, that yeah. was something that, that beat us definitely. So we had to implement that prefetching ourselves. Uh, other than that, it just means that we don't get the benefits of the operating system cache. So you want to tune the the compute instance differently than you would tune vanilla Postgres. Like with with vanilla Postgres, you would want to uh, like only use a part of your memory for the shared buffer cache because the operating and, and leave the rest to operating system cache. But that doesn't work with 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 this because uh, there is no operating system cache. Yep. We yeah. might want to implement like something we've been thinking of is to actually implement another level of caching for like a local in-memory or this cache in the compute, but haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm.